Good evening and welcome to Allen's Italy. Uh, tonight we welcome back our old friend Rick Hurst. Rick, thank you. Thank you. For coming back. Um, Rick hasn't been here for quite a while. Yeah. We did a little research, you know, and the last time you were here was five months ago for the Tuscania show. Right. Right, so that was the last time. And actually tonight we are going to be talking about, let me go to the album, that always makes life a little easier. There's no easy way of doing this, so we have to go through the whole process. Okay, so it's uh, show number 76, which is Michelangelo in Rome. And uh, this show uh, was put together at roughly the same time. The idea for the show was put together at roughly the same time that I conceived the idea to do Michelangelo in Florence. And I was going to uh, talk about all of the sculpture and art that Michelangelo has in Florence. Not that he did in Florence, but that now appears in Florence for the visitor who wants to see it. And at the same time, of course, when one puts together a show about Michelangelo in Florence, you also have to put together a show of Michelangelo in Rome, because many of his work is in Rome as well. So, uh, so we did Show number nine, which was a very long time ago, uh, now we're up to number 76, so 16, 67 shows ago, we did this, this one, which was called Michelangelo in Florence. And uh, uh, that's the picture that, that we used uh, at the time, if you remember. And of course, we had decided that we would do a show, Michelangelo in Rome. It took a, about a year and a half, but here we are. Um, with that one, so um, let's let's begin. So, actually, uh, this is the uh, this is the Casa Bonarote, which is a house that Michelangelo had had bought on spec and wound up uh, giving to his nephew to live in. Um, and in this, and this is uh, this house has now been turned into a museum and contained two of his earliest contains two of his earliest uh, work, uh, the Battle of the Centaurs. These are, these are relief sculptures that he did when he was still a teenager. And this is Madonna of the Stairs, uh, which I believe were both done in the sculpture garden, the, yes. the Medici sculpture garden. That's correct. Okay, so that's, that sets the stage. And then, of course, um, his Bacchus, which is now in the Bargello in Florence, but was actually sculpted in Rome. But since we're focusing on his work in Rome, that brings us to the beginning of tonight's theme. And uh, we start in St. Peter's Square, and that is one of my favorite pictures of all the ones I have of Rome. That is taken from the top, I believe, of, of, the, dome. of the dome. We'll get to the dome later. But as you walk into the cathedral and into that um, hallway and take a sharp right, you come to the first piece that we're going to talk about. Right. Uh, the Pietà, which uh, was originally commissioned uh, in 1498 for um, a, a French cardinal, uh, Cardinal Belair. Uh, cardinal Belair died and uh, so it became into the possession of the Pope. Uh -huh. And it was then installed in, uh, uh, in Rome on the north side of the, of the uh, nave. <clears throat> it's a beautiful statue. It's one of the few that's finished. Um, he actually had the time to finish it. Uh, Michelangelo often took on too many commissions at once. When you take a look at his chronology, you see that he has many overlapping commissions so that practically nothing can be done all at once. Mm. But this was, this was his major monumental task, which took him a, uh, two years to do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's finished all the way through uh, along... Um, 
the Madonna's chest, as a matter of fact, is a okay, belt. Close up. Yeah, is a belt. And he had overheard, Michelangelo had overheard when this statue was unveiled that someone said, oh, this must have been done by another sculptor, a rival sculptor. And so at night, he went into the, into the building and carved out in Latin, uh, Michel Michelangelo Buonarroti uh, of Florentine made this. <laughs> so, uh, and he regretted that later. He said, I'll never sign another thing again. Huh. Uh, he didn't say why, but but he said that was that was the case. Well, you know, I think that you know he was young, yeah, and he was, and his reputation had not got to the point where it is, right. And he just kind of kind of wanted to be known as being the sculptor of this piece as opposed to somebody <clears throat> else. I, I so think he was carried away by a little vanity, which he then kind of after after he became famous. Regretted he didn't really it. care about that so much. Yeah. Right, exactly. Uh -huh. um, there were there were several controversies about about this Pietà. One is, that, as you can see, um, instead of being elderly, the Madonna looks young, almost younger than her son, and that is because he wanted to emphasize the fact that she was a, a virgin, and that's one of the methods that. Mm was often used in painting to emphasize this. As a matter of fact, the whole statue is uh, something totally unusual for um, Italian art. Uh, it's, it's very northern, and I think uh, that's why uh, Michelangelo did this for Cardinal Belair, because Cardinal Belair was French, and this was a typical sculpted scene in uh, French iconography. So, <clears throat> why? why? Why was this a northern concept as opposed to an Italian concept? Was, was uh, I think the had Italian... Had there never been a, a Pietà done prior? Uh, yes, there had been Pietà's done prior, but, but this is an emphasis of um, the tragedy of the, uh, of the death. And for the most part, in fact, even at the beginning, Italian art depicting uh, the death of Christ always showed some sort of triumphalism that uh, resurrection triumphs over death. But in this, he clearly was depicting, um, albeit a beautiful figure, a dead figure. So, uh, but that was, um, that was more acceptable in the North to, uh, to portray the tragedy of the crucifixion. Right. Okay. So of course, this is <clears throat> this is her. This is uh, it's a slightly different angle. Right. Uh, it's slightly different angle. As a matter of fact, it, it's interesting. If you look at the back of the statue, oh, uh, there that. is no there's no carving on the back. It was all it's all carved from the sides and the front, and, and that's because it would cost too much money to carve something that was just going to go into a niche. Oh, I see. And that was typical of most sculpture. When you see it from the front and the sides, that's all you get, um, especially if it's going to be set back. So um, the, uh, the, all the pictures that you see are never from the extreme right or the extreme left. Hmm. But you, but and yet you say it's it's a completely finished piece. It's completely finished in the areas that are finished. Oh, wow. um, he must have spent an enormous amount of time polishing this sculpture, because nothing he has done after that mm -hmm. looks remotely like this. Mm -hmm. And is this due to the fact that number one, he did have the time because he was young? And yes. maybe didn't have quite as many commissions because he was had after no this, other commissions. Because it was after this that his his career really took off. Well, yes and no. After after this, for two years, he'd actually had no commissions, hmm. and um, and brief. He had, you know, he had done this piece, and there's no written record of anything that he's done. And yet, when. The uh, Signoria of Florence decided to do a David. Right. He was the one selected, and they didn't they use yes, because this as the piece that 
<clears throat> yes, because many people had seen this and were incredibly impressed mm -hmm. uh, by this piece. He actually did two pieces for the Signoria. One is a Bronze David. Okay, this is a real close-up. Yeah. Boy, that is... <laughs> That's uh, really extraordinarily beautifully done. I mean, the hair is something you don't see again until Bernini. Um, this is uh, a, a drama besides drama. Now, was it, was it the French Cardinal's suggestion that it be yeah, a I Pieta? He wanted a Pieta. He wanted a Pieta, and I think it uh, was either in discussion with the Cardinal or uh, on his own volition uh, because um, uh, Michelangelo knew a great deal about art in uh, Northern Europe. Mm. So, uh, you know, he could have made... How? This. How did he know a lot about art? Did um, he go up there? Uh, no, he didn't go up there, but he knew from um, various collections that were among the cardinals mm. and bishops in uh, Florence and especially Rome that um, he was familiar with all of the greats from Van Eyck on down to the his current day. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. And uh, we come to uh, another piece. This is located. It, you know, I I I laugh about. I, it's not funny, but I just feel that. Uh, well, we'll tell the story. This is the Chiesa San Pietro in Vincoli, which means the Church of Saint Peter's, Saint Peter in Chains, and this is. This is the church which houses the chains that brought St. Peter to Rome, and they put, it, it, it's housed in this church. And in this church is another one of, the, another very, very famous work by Michelangelo, Michelangelo's Moses. And uh, would you like to talk a little yeah, bit about this? Um, originally, uh, Julius II, the, the warrior pope, um, had commissioned uh, Michelangelo to do a vast uh, uh, tomb, freestanding tomb, huge thing with 40 statues, in, uh, which was going to be in the middle of uh, the new St. Peter's. Uh, and when he commissioned this, when he commissioned this huge, gigantic thing, um, he gave a free hand to Michelangelo to design it. So Michelangelo went out diligently and went to Carrara to pick out the stone. And um, one, of the, one of the major pieces that came out of that earliest period was the, um, was the Moses. And um, originally, the Moses was going to be about 12 feet above the floor. So the, the, the position that you see now is not the way Michelangelo had proposed it. Hmm. And over the years, after uh, Julius died in 1513, uh, the um, contract kept on changing. Um, Julius was part of the very famous Della Rovere family. And... Um, the, they spent less and less and less money on the, uh, on the project. And it took until 1545. It was originally commissioned in 1505, but this wasn't installed into, until 1545. So, that, so the tomb now has only three statues by Michelangelo and the rest are by other sculptors. Of the original 40. Uh, as a matter of fact, of the original 40, only three have been by Michelangelo. Huh. And the rest are the unfinished slaves, two of them in the Louvre, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, four of them in, uh, the, in the Academia right. in Florence, right. which are brilliant and uh, huge. Um, and all unfinished. And all unfinished. All of them are unfinished. But in various states of completion, it makes it really... I mean, we, we, we spoke about that when we did that. Right. Um, he also did the uh, victory, the genius of victory, which... In the Palazzo um, Vecchio. Yeah, which is in the Palazzo Vecchio, but uh, it was presumed to be for um, Julius's tomb, as is the Apollo David 
some people think was for the for Julius's tomb mm. as well. But you know what's interesting? What's interesting is that what, what I read this morning and what I remember reading from uh, The Agony and the Ecstasy by Irving Stone, um, it was Julius himself that sort of stopped the project because he suddenly decided he wanted the Sistine ceiling to be. Right. Um, he stopped the project um, after um, Michelangelo had gone back to Florence. Um, hmm. And... Um, and initially, when he when he began all of the statues, he had said he ran out of money. Michelangelo said, "I've run out of money." Uh, apparently, the Pope was very furious, and um, and Michelangelo went back to uh, Florence. So uh, the uh, the thing came to a grinding halt until. Uh, the Pope said, you've got to come back or I'm going to make war on Florence. <laughs> so Come back to do the, right. the sculptures or come back to do the Sistine? The Sistine Chapel. Oh, so he, he changed the project in midstream. Yes, he changed the project in midstream. Uh, partly, they believe, at, at, the, um, at, the, at uh, the request of Raphael, who um, uh, didn't want to uh, have... Um, uh, Michelangelo, or actually wanted Michelangelo to fail at doing the uh, the ceiling. Really? Yeah. So that that's the that's the argument. So he didn't really know Michelangelo. He only he knew him by reputation. Right. But and he was already he was already doing this for the Pope in his apartments. Right. And he said, why don't you have, he, he made the suggestion, yeah. why don't you have Michelangelo do this here? Okay, we'll get to the Sistine yeah. in a moment. So at any rate... Uh, so let's go to Moses. Wait a minute. Well, first you want to okay. show this. As you can see, uh, this is Giuliano de' Medici in his uh, tomb and the new sacristy uh, in Florence. And you can see his head is turned and his one knee is back and one hand is resting on that knee. Oftentimes, Michelangelo used the same drawings, sometimes reversed. Sometimes he used the same mm. maquettes, sometimes reversed, to do other statues or paintings. Now, a maquette, explain to the audience. Okay, a maquette is a small model um, of the sculpture that the sculptor is going to do. Right. Uh, most of the time, they were less than a foot tall. Um, even if the sculpture was going to be um, seven and a half feet tall, the way the Moses is, um, that was it was the original thoughts that the sculptor has. Now, so what you're saying is this? Um, well, let's go to the comparison. Yeah, you can see one knee is back. Well, he's he's facing, he's facing the left. Look at, you know, from his point of view. That's correct. And, his, and just as... His, his left leg is also... And the left behind. leg is behind the right leg. Right. Which is straight, as in this one. That's correct. So that's very similar. And <laughs> one hand is on... One hand is on his right hand. Left hand is on his lap. Right. Which is exactly what this is. this guy's doing. Right. So uh, you can see... Very here similar. Often, he often did this because he would find uh, positions that were very dramatic. Mm. Um, even in the static Florentine tradition, he would find more dynamic poses. It's not like Bernini, but it's, it's clearly a more dynamic pose than, for example, Donatello's St. Mark's. Right, okay, now let's go to a close-up. Right. I mean, this beard, this, the hair and the beard here is, is pretty amazing also. Right. During the uh, restoration, uh, not too many years ago, uh, the chief of the restoration um, examined the statue very carefully. And his opinion is that uh, the statue was recut in the 1540s hmm. um, in order to uh, generate a much more um, dynamic statue. Initially... It was going to be one of the statues, 12 feet up, in this huge assemblage of, of sculptures. Mm. Uh, now it's going to be the centerpiece of a much smaller sculpture. So from the evidence that he saw, he felt that 
um, Moses originally faced front and his two knees were together. But because this became the focus of attention, he believes, the, the head was recut to look to the side. And when you're up close to it, it the head does look a little narrow hmm. for, the, for the length of the head. Uh, and also there's a little jog in the beard. It, it's not one of smoothly flowing locks. So it could very well be. The other little problem is, is that the knee that's back is considerably smaller than the knee that's forward. Okay, let's see if we have a close-up of that. Uh, no, we have mostly the face. I have mostly the face, so... Right. It's hard to tell in this, but the knee that's, that's uh, pulled toward the back right. is, is actually kind of noticeably smaller, but the... It appears that way. But the... But the unless you're actually focusing on it, it, the drapery sort of covers up that problem. Okay. Now, what, one thing I must ask you to explain to the audience is, yeah. talk a little bit about the horns. Oh. Um, during the 300s, when um, Jerome translated the Bible from, from ancient Hebrew to the Vulgate Latin, um, he mistranslated um, an old Hebrew word whose root means something attached to the head. So it could, depending upon how the root is used, it could mean horns, it could mean antlers, it could mean rays, or it could mean an aura. Wow. But it's anything that surrounds or is attached to the head. So um, the translation has been kept, or had been kept, for more than a thousand years. And, and the, the uh, misconception, of course, that Jews have horns right. uh, developed came, from, from, from that. From that, plus, uh, plus in the Middle Ages, um, the Jews were uh, uh, tormented because they were moneylenders. And, and in order to um, demonize them, literally, they were conflated with Satan, who has horns in various paintings all over Europe. Hmm. Okay, that's uh, this is a close-up of yeah. You can it's 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 interesting. You know, those are the tablets of the law, and he was supposed to have brought those down, uh, but there's nothing on them. Yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting thing. So th that's one of the other reasons it's believed that uh, his head was cut to the side rather than rather than looking forward but Be why was why, because why was that? now now he's looking to the side with this angry visage uh taking a look at the um israelites worshiping the golden calf oh i see and of course but originally it was before he was going up to go onto the mountain now the only art history course i ever took i told you about this was when I was, uh, I believe, 18 years old in yeah. 1967. Does that make sense? I might, well, it must have been 66. <laughs> um, and the only thing I remember about that course was my teacher speaking about the, how the fingers are intertwined Twined. into the hair. I guess yeah. that's pretty amazing. His, um, well, first of all, it's his concept of anatomy and um, his concept of the articulation of hands was stupendous. I mean, many, many, many drawings are drawings of hands. Um, so I think he considered those just as dramatic as a facial expression or a body pose. Uh -huh. Okay, let's see what else we have. There's a, another view of it. He looks Head pretty on um, fierce over there. Quite determined. He just yeah. looked at the Israelites with the golden calf, and he's pissed. He's really he's, pissed. He's really annoyed at that. That's a, right. There's his gaze, which looks pretty formidable. And uh, these are the two pieces that are flanking right. Moses. The Rachel and the Leah, or the contemplative life and the, act, and the active life. Um, those were blocked out 
by Michelangelo, but they were finished by one of his um, assistants. Um, mm. uh, and um, Raffaello de Montalupo, who, who was a very good sculptor in his own right. Mm -hmm. And um, when they were done, Michelangelo just didn't like them. Hmm. So I think it's because there's some lack of fire and drama in the finishing of them that he was expecting when he started blocking them Certainly out. Certainly compared to Moses. Well, right. even compared to the Madonna Bruges, um, there, there's less purity in the way the faces are cut um, and then the way the hands are articulated. Am I putting you on the spot by asking you who Leah, Leah and Rachel were? Uh, no, Leah and Rachel were two Old Testament figures. Okay. Um, who were, oh, you know, now I can't remember. No, which of the, which one <laughs> was which? Okay. Okay. I think it's Leah and Rachel. So oh, yeah. it's left to right, Leah is right. the one on the left, and right, Rachel is the one, one on, on the right. right. But we don't know what they... They're biblical figures. They're biblical. biblical figures. And here's, you know, I mean, we know it's not Michelangelo. Well, it, it, the concept was Michelangelo. Right. And it probably was brought up to the stage where it was in the rough. Uh, and then um, Montalupo was supposed to finish them off mm -hmm. and install them. Okay. All righty. Now we come to the Sistine Chapel. So if you, if you saw the movie or read the book, I read the book before I saw the movie, actually, The Agony and the Ecstasy, right. which doesn't cover... Um, well, actually, the movie is different from the book. The book covers his entire life, right? but the movie only covers the Sistine Chapel part. Right. So um, this is the story of... Uh, and that's what the Sistine Chapel, which most people do not see from this angle. Right. Even, you know, even, even when you're in the Vatican museums, you're kind of wandering through this maze of, of hallways. You don't see the Sistine Chapel from this angle. Right. But, Actually, it was a separate building. Oh, was it? Uh -huh. Yeah, it was part of the Apostolic uh, Palace, the Papal Apartments. Mm -hmm. It was only after a time that um, that everything became added to and joined. Uh, initially, um, there was there was one um, uh, chapel before that that um, that had been sort of fallen into ruin. Here it is, right? Yeah. And this is what it looked like, supposedly. It, yes. And um, <clears throat> this was uh, restored by... Um, Leonardo da Melia. Um, but let's, let's, let's go back. So the Sistine Chapel was actually commissioned by Sixtus, right. Pope Sixtus, who had it adorned, as you could see, right. around the base. Let me just use my pointer to show that point. Right. These, these are all the paintings right. around the periphery right. of and the Sistine Chapel, done by Botticelli and Perugino, Ghirlandaio, let's yeah. get into the details. And the ceiling was the way it looks there, which was unfinished. Which right. was, it was finished, but it wasn't anything spectacular. It was blue. It was azure blue with uh, gold stars. Okay. Uh, now, uh, when Sixtus had, this, uh, had the uh, place restored and uh, painted, um, this was a... <clears throat> it's a long and somewhat narrow but tall building and has a barrel vault as you can see. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it's not like a, a gothic vault, so it was relatively easy to paint on. Um, but this is what he came, this is what he found. That's what Michelangelo This is what he found. started with. Right, that's what okay. he started with. And Julius decided to, um, to decorate uh, the cathedral because that's, uh, that's the project that he then turned to um, after he stopped uh, work on his tomb. Because Raphael kind of... Yeah, sort of whispered idea. in his ear. Oh, that's interesting. So, uh, the, and this uh, turned into... This. this. Well, it's kind of an interesting program because the <clears throat> along the bottom, 
where you see frescoes right now, uh, they're frescoes of curtains. But in reality, there are real curtains that had been designed by Raphael that were made in uh, Bruges. Um, and they depict, they're not there, they're only put on there periodically. Oh. And they depict the life of, uh, the life of St. Paul and the life of St. Peter. What do you mean curtains? They're tapestries? like tapestries. Tapestries, yeah. Yeah, okay. huge tapestries. Designed by Raphael. Designed by Raphael, executed in, um, in Bruges, which was the tapestry center in Europe. Hmm. Um, and above that um, are the two bands, as you point out. Uh, one is the uh, story of Christ, and the other is the story of Moses, which describes the covenants as conceived by uh, the Jews and the Gentiles. And then above that are, are the first popes, and then only after that, from that spring line up, are the panels that uh, Michelangelo did, 5,000 square feet of them. And it took him four years. Four years, four years. And uh, I, I've read conflicting uh, things that conflict. One, one said that he did it on his back, one said that he did not do it on his back. Well, actually, you know? there's a drawing that Michelangelo did of himself standing on his scaffold, mm -hmm. painting, and he's standing. Uh -huh. um, right next to it is a poem dedicated to how miserable he was, <laughs> um, having his neck turned upward all the time to take a look at the painting. Now, did he become injured from this? Was he like, I, I've also read things that he became injured and he had all kinds of things, and, and that's why it's one of the reasons it took so long. Well, uh, quite frankly, it was probably, there were two reasons why. First of all, there are more than 300 figures in this. Oh. And at first he didn't want to do it because uh, Julius wanted him to do the Twelve Apostles. And he said, eh, the Twelve Apostles, that's kind of puny. So then, theoretically, Julius let him have his own hand again. So he said, I'm going to do the whole story of Genesis and the origins of Christ on the ceiling. So he has 340 figures. That's going to take a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, he had studied the um, Orvieto Cathedral by Luca Signorelli. Oh. And he admired that greatly. And so he wanted to make something equally as dramatic as the, um, as the chapel in, in the Orvieto Cathedral. Now, to me, it, it's very geometric. Yeah. Um, that must have taken him quite a bit of time to kind of uh, measure the way it's supposed to be in terms of its perfection of you know, I don't know if those are triangles or what, what they are, but... Yeah, those, those spandrels. I mean, he's made a lot of false architecture oh. on, top of the, on top of real architecture. Mm -hmm. um, not built architecture, but sort of created illusionistic spaces, right. um, which also that. took a long time. Well, this is, a, this is a flat view of it. Right. And you can see that... You can see how geometric it is. Yeah. But that's, uh, but that's an expression of uh, Renaissance thought, that um, regularity, symmetry, um, uh, all of those were um, Renaissance ideals, which they felt they took from ancient Greece and Rome. And so uh, all of this architectural division is so that he can tell the story sort of in panels, like a comic book. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, yeah. that's basically yeah, I it. See. So the central... Is it chron it's a, you know, a chronological... Well, no. Toward the direction of the, um, of the altar, the central s rectangular panels, there are nine of them, and they represent the first three acts in Genesis of the creation of the world mm -hmm. by God. The next three represent... Um, the uh, creation of man and woman uh, and their expulsion from the Garden of Eden, which is their rejection of the perfection of God. And the next one is that mankind is so bad that um, God creates this huge flood, so it's three stories of Noah from the Genesis. Hmm. And then he has around that 
all the stories and the prophecies of the coming of Christ, as well as um, many of the many of the um, uh, statements of ecclesiastical authority. So this was a huge, huge design undertaking. He knew his Bible. He read it every day, and he may have been helped by um, Cardinal Egidio, who is one of the major theological uh, experts at the time. Uh, uh, but he, he, he was a pretty knowledgeable guy. Okay, now this, of course, is what every, you know, the most famous part of it. Right. Um, the, let's see, do I have a close-up of that? No, let's go back to this then. So, right, right in the center is that iconic figure right. of uh, God, God giving life, life, life to, to Adam. Adam. And, um, you know, as Adam's hand is sort of limp and God's is pointed straight out. Right. right. And he's got a bunch of other people around him. Um, he's got his buds, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, and and uh, there's Adam all alone. So, I mean, this is you can't get a much more dramatic um, version of creation. I mean, he already has this angular um, segment to the to the right side, and. And the and God the Father is surrounded in this corona hmm. on the left side. Wow, so he's opposing. That. That's interesting. He's, he's opposing the rigid and the sinister to the creative. Wow. Okay. Never realized that. This is one of the sibyls. This is the uh, Libyan sibyl, um, and uh, it's it's a remarkable achievement when uh, when you realize that um, each one of these days has to start with his muratore, his uh, mason, applying the final layer of stucco, the antonico, to the wall, and then you have to wait an hour or two so that it's not too wet and it's not too dry. And then he's got to go from a cartoon, which is a full-scale figure, or he's got to take a smaller drawing and then by eye scale it up. Huh. And um, before the before, before it dries, before, before it, it dries. dries, right. So yeah. only in one day can you do sections. Sometimes he could do an entire person. Sometimes he could only do a section. And if you look carefully, you can see each giornata. So huh. uh, and then at the end of that. The mason had to be there to feather out the end of the plaster, and then they had to mix up the plaster anew each day, and it had wow. to be the same formula, otherwise the wow. colors would change. And he had to have a color mixer, so um, Michelangelo wasn't doing this himself. He, well, he didn't do it alone. Okay. No, he well, didn't yeah, do that's it alone. the uh, that's what they make it because seem you like couldn't buy two paints; everything had to be ground. Mm -hmm. And this is, well, this is a scene that shows the difference between the cleaned and and um, and dirty version of the uh, of the painting. The upper right hand shows the areas that had been um, become grimy from uh, candles and uh, and smoke, and then the colors that were revealed after the uh, cleaning. Uh -huh. uh, and um, it, the, of course, the controversy over cleaning was uh, just incredibly bitter. I can imagine because they believe that Michelangelo came back and took dry paint to add highlights or um, other uh, other details. And of course, with the way in which they uh, restored it, it would remove that. But it, it's not clear whether that was true or not. Right. Okay, this is back to that. That should have been closer to the other thing, right. but there's a close-up of... Right, the unclean version of it. You can uh -huh. see it's almost monochromatic. Yeah. And this is, of course, one of his drawings. I, I love these drawings. Uh, drawings by Michelangelo are superb in their, not only knowledge of anatomy, but how to change anatomy to make it look more dynamic. There aren't that many muscles bulging in the back. 
that's the drawing for the um, Libyan Sybil. Um, you can see it was one of his apprentices that he was drawing. It was mm -hmm. not a woman he was drawing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can also see that he uh, used his drawings as teaching examples mm -hmm. because he would point out um, the uh, acromion process on top of the shoulders. He would have a little line and then a zero over there. So you've got to put these in, guys, when you draw it. And it reminds me of his sculpture, you know, yeah. the, the muscularity. And the muscularity and the fact that there are more muscles there than you can possibly have. <laughs> um, but, but that's a way of showing the dynamic power of the human body. Some of the people that I come across at the YMCA yeah. who do weightlifting, yeah. You would we, we'd have to discuss that because they they look like they're they, pretty they well look defined like as well. Yeah, this drawing is in the Metropolitan. Um, oh, really? Yeah, and it's about the size of a page. Uh huh. So uh, it could be that he just scaled up this drawing just by eye. Uh huh. Okay, this is another another drawing of of the atom, and right. you can see sometimes he would have the hand drawn in separately so he could have a better detail. Hmm. And he didn't draw the head because heads were not that important didn't to him. Didn't need the head. He, he, he didn't draw the head. No. It wasn't important. Right, okay. And of course, this is um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the greats in the um, uh, Chapel of the Carmine um, by Masaccio. This is in Florence, Florence. at the Brancacci Chapel. Chapel. Yeah. And this is the... Uh, I guess he may have he may have done uh, Masaccio may have done the first uh, Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden. Well, no, actually, an early a, one. Yeah, there there were many, but this is one of the few early Renaissance types that show them relatively naked. Mm. Uh, before that, they would always cover up um, all of the private parts with something. Was there else. always so much emotion? Very rarely was there so much emotion. And the fact is that he was sort of copying Giotto's way of showing emotion in the face mm. and, um, and gestures so that the turned down eyebrows of Eve, uh, you see a lot, you'll see it a lot in uh, uh, Giotto's work. But this is Masaccio, and this, this, is, is, this is one of... Um, the scenes from on, in the, on the Sistine, so let's point that out. Right. Okay, now this is The Last Judgment. The Last Judgment, done more, about 25 years later. Um, so again, this is behind the, the, the altar. altar. This, this is, is behind, behind the, altar. the altar. This is not the ceiling. Yeah, this is, the, this is like a piece de resistance for, um, for Michelangelo. You can see that it's unlike all of the other registered paintings in fresco. Uh, you know, when you take a look at the Sistine, each thing is divided up into sections. Yeah, yeah. Like panels. Right. Here, everything is sort of revolving around Christ. It's an unusual composition that had never been done before, that, that it hadn't grounded things. So each one of the stories is continuous. Um, in fact, it's believed that Michelangelo painted himself into uh, the... <clears throat> oh, do I have that? No. no. There, no. Yes, that, he did. There it is? There it is. Uh, that's St. Bartholomew, who was flayed. Oh, right, right, right. And, but the flayed skin he's holding is supposedly a, the flayed skin of Mike Michelangelo. Right, right. So this piece, this person right here is a self-portrait of yeah, Michelangelo. As suffering. As suffering, and, and he was suffering at that time? I mean, was he going he was, through... Uh, he was an incredibly religious person who felt he was steeped in sin and could never achieve salvation. Huh. It was... Um, his poems that he wrote about this are extraordinarily moving. Mm -hmm. uh, but from the first day to the last, or at least from the time after he was um, in Bologna to, to this day, um, to his death, he was always a tortured soul. Wow.
Okay, now we have to move a little faster now. Not a problem. But we come to the Campidoglio. Right, which was on top of the Capitoline Hill. Um, and during the Roman period, it was this uh, um, an incredible collection of, um, of huge temples. Um, and it faced the Forum. So you could see uh, the, the, what they now call the Campidoglio from the Forum uh, and, and vice versa. Um, now it's sort of closed off. Now, I don't mean closed off, closed off, but it ha doesn't have the same relationship to the Forum. Right. Uh -huh. um, and um, uh, um, Michelangelo was called in in the 1540s to uh, redesign uh, the Campidoglio to make it look presentable because it was a mess. <laughs> Uh, the um, uh, the one building that you see there at the end was the um, the senator building. Well, th th this way this way I think gives you a better view of it. That's the Senate building. Right. Let me let me see what I have here. No, okay. So this is the one. This is the only one that gives you the Senate building. That's correct. So this is looking towards it going up the steps. That's right. That he designed. He designed the steps. Um, he designed, redesigned portions of the facade and the interior, I think the first floor mm -hmm. of that Senate building. It is now um, a, um, the um, mayor of Rome's uh, offices. And Frank Pelaya and his wife were married oh. in that building. Oh, very nice. Well, when he was on the show, we showed that. What a great setting. Yeah, uh, yeah they, they know how to pick them. Yeah. And uh, if you go behind that building, you get the most beautiful view of the Roman Forum, but you have to go behind the building right. completely. So now we have right. to move a little faster. Okay. This is the view of the Campidoglio from the top of the Senate building. Right, and you can see that there are two um, two palaces: um, the um, uh, the Conciliatory Palace and the Nuovo Palace, and they were done in symmetrical terms. The the um, the um, a conservatory palace was, uh, the facade was redesigned by um, Michelangelo and much of the interior. And um, much later in the 17th century, uh, the new palace was designed taking uh, his blueprints, taking Michelangelo's bl blueprints and just uh, mirroring them. Now do you notice something very strange here? I, I took a close look. That pedestal in the middle yeah. usually had the, uh, statue, of the statue of Marcus Aurelius. Aurelius that was done from ancient times, but it was moved into one of the museums. Right, and then there's a, there's a reproduction. But this is the time when it was moved and hadn't been replaced. replaced. So that's, that's an interesting picture. Right, and the uh, original is in one of the museums, the right. Capitoline Museums, right. which are wonderful. Now, the Piazza Minerva brings us to um, another church. This is the church of uh, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, Minerva, meaning Santa Maria on top of the Temple of Minerva, Minerva. from ancient times. Right. And in here, which is a, it's a beautiful church. Yeah. But to talk the right about of the this altar. The risen to, church, the risen Christ. Christ. Yeah, the risen Christ was done specifically for this church. Uh, and again, it's one of the um, pieces that uh, Michelangelo blocked out, but did not finish. Mm. Um, and um, it's, it's a beautiful piece. I believe he worked on it a lot more than the Rachel and Leah, because the face is very expressive. Um, but it's true, the finishing and installation was done again by Roberto da Montelupo. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this is, this is more, a, this is a, another polished piece, uh, but it wasn't polished by Michelangelo himself. Um, and the loincloth in bronze um, was placed there first during the Counter-Reformation, then taken off and for some reason put back. Yeah, we don't know when that, because I, I, I had seen this uh, many, many years ago. This, right. this, this picture was taken, I believe, in the year 2012. I had been to this spot in the year 2001. I don't recall that that cloth in the in the genital area. So I think that was added for right. some reason. Maybe there was a, I, I don't know. I don't know. No idea. 
Okay, now you don't have now, much time, so. Now, <laughs> now this, is, um, this is one of the crowning achievements in Rome, uh, St. Peter's Cathedral. Uh, old St. Peter's was founded by Constantine um, in um, uh, 298 to 306. And, uh, um, and because the popes had split up and gone to Avignon in the 14th century, a great deal of neglect um, had uh, destroyed portions of the, old, of the old cathedral. It was a big cathedral. Uh, and so the plans were made by Julius, once again, to have it redesigned. Um, and um, there were many redesigns put forward by Bramante, first of all, mm -hmm. uh, Jacopo Sansovino, uh, by Raphael, um, and by Michelangelo. And by, by far... Uh, Michelangelo's is probably the most uh, graceful. Um, the original plan called for a Greek cross plan with a dome on top. And Bramante's idea was to have a very rigid Greek cross plan, a, a, you know, a rectangle crossed by a rectangle um, with a pantheon-like dome on top. And, um, and four of the piers, central piers, were built for that purpose. Um, but uh, when Michelangelo took it over, he looked over the plans for all of the other hmm. architects. And he said, you know, Greek cross plan is pretty good, and I think I will keep that. And he changed, he changed the outside to soften up the cross. It's almost as if um, the, the diagonals of the cross fit within a circle. It's really a beautiful design. Uh, he, so he designed the church in addition to the dome? Because I was yeah. thinking it was just the dome. Oh, no. He designed the church wow. in addition to the dome. And he was the chief architect of the Capo Maestro on the dome for 20 years. Huh. Uh, not only the dome, but the building. Huh. And under his direction, the building took considerable, uh, was considerably built so that afterward, uh, his successors could actually finish the building of it. Hmm. Um, not many drawings are left, I think because they were destroyed by, you know, masons trying to copy uh, the masonry profiles and the, yeah, yeah. and the other people building it. The problem is, is that he had designed it so you could see a pointed dome and he deliberately chose the dome by Brunelleschi from Florence because it was a brilliantly designed dome and it's slightly smaller yeah. than the uh, dome in Florence. But it does, it does resemble the dome of Florence more than it resembles the Oh, it doesn't the resemble the Pantheon, it resemble Pantheon, Pantheon at all. Uh, the Pantheon is a one, one monopore of concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, this is done with a brick interior and a stone exterior with uh, 16 ribs. Um, so the front is not by Michelangelo. The front is by another architect uh, named Maderno, who put a nave in front of the Greek cross plan and then put this gigantic facade in the front. It's very long and very narrow back to front. When you're in the cathedral square, you can't see the dome hmm. because... Um, the facade blocks the view. So oh. initially, you would not have seen this right after uh, Michelangelo designed it. Okay. We've got to be running out of time, Alan. We are. All right. Let's, let's just do a quick run through of, of his other pieces. Right. We won't talk about them too much. Nope. This was originally the Baths of Diocletian that... Michelangelo was commissioned to create the church of Santa Maria degli Angeli. Okay, one minute. There we go. All right. And this was the, the third floor of the Farnese Palace. Palace. And the Pauline mm -hmm. Chapel in the Vatican, a crucifixion that was commissioned. The, uh, the, the crucifixion, actually, this is the crucifixion 
of Saint Peter, Peter. but there's also another piece uh, of this Saint one, Paul, Saint, his conversion. Right. So those are the two pieces. And the next show, my next show is going to be a show on one of my favorite restaurants in Florence, La Grotto de Leo, with interviews of the owner oh, great. and the pizza chef. Oh, terrific. And some of the waiters. So it's really a fun, it's a fun show and there's some really great interviews. And uh, let me say uh, thank you very well, much. thank you. It was fun. And... I feel like I've been to school. Oh. <laughs> so thank you very much. And we welcome you to come back any anytime. Okay. And we'll and you definitely will. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. And on behalf of, of Rick and me, Bona Notte e Bona Fortuna.